Hi everyone, welcome to our Psych 34 video. Today we're going to be discussing divisions of the nervous system. Um, so a thing that you really learn sort of early on in the year towards the start of the study design and is really foundational for a lot of different topics, a lot of different concepts, um, because it's this whole idea, you know, obviously you look a lot at the little details of psych in terms of neurons, neurotransmission, you know, all those sorts of key things. Um, but the divisions of the nerves, nervous system are sort of putting that little bigger picture of communication together and how an organism, you know, namely a human responds to external and internal stimuli. So there are a lot of key things to know on this topic. The things that we're going to be covering today, obviously looking at the divisions of the human nervous system. So their purposes, how they are obviously linked to one another. Um, this idea of your main separation in terms of your central and your peripheral nervous system. Again, talking about the different types of neurons involved and how we're able to basically coordinate a response. Um, really importantly, when we talk about the autonomic nervous system, looking at this distinction between your sympathetic and your parasympathetic, this is a really, really key thing to learn as part of this um, sort of concept because it comes in again, particularly when you talk about stress. So having good knowledge of it now is really, really important in order to be able to answer questions about the stress response. Um, and then we'll have a look at some practice questions. So a couple of multiple choice and short answer applying the things that we discussed today. So the first thing we're going to talk about is just basically a big overview of the nervous system. So here we have our key sort of diagram. What's really important for you guys to understand is this idea of how they divide and how they sort of separate from the larger division. So your overarching thing is obviously your nervous system and that breaks into your central and your peripheral. Um, I should mention it's good to understand, you know, what the whole purpose of the nervous system is. It's so that your body essentially has this sort of method of communicating, you know, with different parts. We have this idea of communicating with your environment. So, you know, detecting things that are going on in the environment, sending that information through to the brain, coordinating a response, you know, organizing a response, and then basically initiating and actually responding to that stimuli. So the whole thing with the nervous system um, and with a lot of sort of, you know, this first basics of psych is this idea that everything is about communication. So everything to do with, you know, your central and your peripheral nervous system, even when you think about the neurons individually, you know, when you think about synaptic transmission, the whole thing, it's really, really linked to communication. So if you remember that and understand that, that sort of helps you. I mean, I find it helps you learn and sort of piece things together a little bit more rather than just trying to rote memorize stuff and, you know, try and rem remember like definitions and things like that. I think finding or learning what the purpose of things actually are can help you a little bit. And then again, that also helps when you're answering your short answer because you can apply yourself to questions a little bit more when you just have better understanding of the content. Um, so you've got your main divisions, your central nervous system, your peripheral nervous system, your central nervous system. All of these are really quite aptly named. So your central nervous system in the center of your body, you're thinking of your brain and your spinal cord. So really, really important. Obviously the brain, I'm sure you're aware of how important it is when we're thinking about understanding information and particularly coordinating a response. The spinal cord is important for essentially linking, you know, your peripheral and your central nervous system particularly with obviously, you know, thinking about like your lower body, your limbs, that sort of thing. Um, but then your peripheral nervous system is this idea of actually receiving the information and then sending it through to the brain via the spinal cord, um, or on the other hand, sending information out. Um, we then look at the somatic and the autonomic. So understand again, knowing the divisions is very important. So central nervous system, it ends there, the brain, the spinal cord, that's it. Peripheral nervous system, you then look at your somatic and your autonomic. So we'll go into these in a bit more detail, but just generally speaking, the somatic you think about with, you know, your voluntary movement, um, the idea of your sensory function with your autonomic nervous system. Again, we link this with our sympathetic and our parasympathetic. So your autonomic is in charge of things that you don't really consciously think about, um, things to do with survival, like thinking of your organs, those sorts of things that you don't need to consciously think about doing and, you know, responding to internal stimuli, but obviously you have to have something in control of that to keep you going. Um, and then we'll talk about your sympathetic and your parasympathetic and their link to stress a little bit. Okay. But really, really important. I can't stress enough. You have to know the divisions because in your questions, often you will just be asked, like, you know, describe the divisions of the autonomic nervous system. They won't explicitly say sympathetic and parasympathetic. So you have to know that the divisions of the autonomic are the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Um, so sort of memorize that diagram that we looked at before, you know, make sure you know your subdivisions. 
Looking at your central nervous system, so again, really, really important in this idea of the actual coordination of a response. Um, our brain is this idea of, again, you get all the information in, you figure out what to do with it, how you want the body to respond, and then you send the instructions to the muscle, you know, to the organ to initiate that response. Um, so really, really important in coordinating, in regulating, in pe just perceiving that information, essentially. Your spinal cord, again, very important for the actual sort of travel of information. Um, so both your sensory and your motor. So again, we think about this idea of the spinal cord being the link between your peripheral nervous system and your brain. So the idea is that your um, peripheral nervous system to do with your sensory or your afferent information, it detects information you know that's in your environment, detects stimuli. It sends that information you know from your sensory receptors in your peripheral nervous system. That information travels through your neurons in your spinal cord, and then will eventually get to your brain. So that's how you, that's how your brain essentially detects and perceives that sensory information. You go from the out in basically, so peripheral nervous system through to spinal cord to brain. Then motor information is just the reverse. Um, so you've got you know this information in the brain. The brain is thinking, okay, I want to respond in this way. So the brain then, you know, organizes that response, figures out what it wants to do, but, you know, it needs its hands to do something or it needs, you know, the liver to do something. It's going to send that information from your brain down to your spinal cord through to your peripheral nervous system, the motor neurons in your peripheral nervous system. And then that's going to cause a response. You know, it's going to contract the muscles in your hands, for example. So that's a really important sort of pathway to understand. Um, and the spinal cord is obviously very, very key in that role. So that's a central nervous system. That's really it. As long as you remember brain and spinal cord, you're kind of set. Peripheral, peripheral nervous system is a little bit more complex. Um, so this idea you've got, again, your sensory information, your motor information ties in very closely to your central nervous system. Your peripheral nervous system, rather than coordinating the response, it's the actual detection and the initiation of that response. Um, so again, you know, you sort of think of this idea of your, um, like your OMG, organs, muscles, glands, all that sort of thing. So anything that, you know, not goes wrong, but, you know, something that's happening in your organs, that information is sent to the brain, you know, things that happen in your muscles. Again, if we're detecting things that are going on, you're sending an afferent signal towards the brain, towards the central nervous system. And then your motor information, which is actually doing something, is coming down from the brain back through to the peripheral nervous system. So again, just like the central, it's very easy to remember sort of where your peripheral nervous system is because it's on the peripheries. So just think about that, your central and then your peripheral. Think about, you know, your limbs, your legs, that sort of thing. Um, and then we'll talk about the divisions as well. So in terms of your somatic nervous system, somatic, you know, sort of meaning this idea of with the body, the idea is that you've got both that motor and sensory part, but often you think about um, the way that I remember it is just this idea of associating it with your sort of more conscious stuff, you know, compared to your autonomic, which you think of being more involuntary. Um, so the idea with your somatic is that often you think about the main thing being the skeletal muscle movement. I know that for probably like a large part of Psych 3 4, I always associated somatic with, you know, voluntary muscle movement. That was like the key phrase that I would always use. So, you know, when you obviously like move your arms, move your legs, you're consciously using your brain to initiate that response. That's part of the somatic nervous system. Um, but a really, really important other aspect of that that I think is forgotten a little bit more um, is this idea of sensation as well. So often students will just think somatic nervous system, it's just my voluntary muscle movement. And that's what I thought for a while as well. Um, but you have to remember that there's still a sensory component of it. You know, it's still part of the peripheral nervous system. Um, so when, again, you're thinking about more of the like conscious sensory stuff that you interpret. So the fact that, you know, if I'm, if I've got my hand on a table, I can feel the table in my hand, or I can feel, you know, my back pressing against the chair. Um, that sort of thing, you know, your touch, your temperature, you know, your taste, your smell, all those sorts of senses, that idea that the somatic nervous system is responsible for that as well. And then again, those senses. So the fact that I can feel, you know, my back touching the chair that I'm sitting on, that is being sent from the, you know, receptors in my back through to my brain and my brain is consciously perceiving that. So again, this idea of your sort of conscious, your voluntary responses, um, that's a really big differentiator when we think about your, you know, your autonomic, like your sympathetic and your parasympathetic stuff, where the sort of stimuli is less, like you're less consciously perceiving it. Um, a really good acronym to sort of remember this is this idea of SAME. So sensory 
is your afferent sort of communication. So afferent means sort of towards the brain coming inwards. So that's your sensory information. So again, if I, if my finger is touching my other finger, you know, the pressure, the texture, everything that I'm feeling on my little pointer finger here, that's your sensory information. You know, those receptors in my finger are sensing all of that information. And then it's sending that information, you know, up through the neurons of my arm, through to the spinal cord, and then to the brain. And then the brain is receiving that afferent information. Then if I want to take my finger off, this idea of my brain is sending this information down through the spinal cord back, literally exact same pathway backwards. But this is motor information, you know, that is going to tell my little finger muscles to contract. And this is your efferent information. So efferent going outwards. So if you remember same or, yeah, I don't know, efferent, maybe like exit or something like that. Um, but yeah, if you ever see the word afferent or efferent, just know that it's sort of um, synonymous with sensory and motor. But that's, again, a really, really key, um, key terms to remember. Okay, moving on to your autonomic nervous system. So again, comparing this to your somatic, it's more your involuntary stuff, more the things that you don't really not care about. Obviously, your body is you know, it's still important. Um, but this idea of things that you just can't really control voluntarily, like the secretion of enzymes, you know, secretion of hormones, um, you know, processes of digestion, for example. So you've got your sympathetic nervous system. Um, and this is that idea of increasing your activity compared to your parasympathetic, which decreases activity. These two are very, very important. And often with your practice questions, they'll overlap with this discussion of stress and particularly the flight, fight, freeze response, which we won't discuss in today's video. Um, but that's that sort of idea of, you know, activating and then calming your body, activating it, calming it. And you sort of like to think of your sympathetic and your parasympathetic as, I like to think of them as a little seesaw. So they're kind of always, you know, balancing each other out. Sometimes your sympathetic will sort of weigh the other one down and will become a little bit more active. Um, and then, you know, at other times your parasympathetic will. So most often your parasympathetic is the one that's dominating a little bit more because, you know, you're calm. You don't really need to arouse the body. You know, you don't really need this sort of extra activity going on, but in situations where you do, you know, like where you're stressed, um, you know, again, sort of that fight, flight, freeze response, um, or this idea of, you know, just generally being, you know, anxious, nervous, that sort of idea is when your sympathetic nervous system kicks in. Um, and it'll be the typical things that you sort of think about. Um, so we can see here this idea of, you know, your pupils dilating, um, you know, your heart rate increasing, blood pressure increasing, that sort of thing. Um, this is obviously a very dense table. You know, there's a lot of content in here. Essentially, you do have to remember it. It comes up a lot with multiple choice questions in terms of, you know, what will happen to the stomach when the sympathetic nervous system is activated? So just have a general idea of them. Um, and I would say always have like three or four that you're able to write about pretty well for your short answer questions. So if it asks about, you know, what are two, um, you know, physiological effects that you might see when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, just have two or three examples. Um, so, you know, talking about your pupils will dilate, your bronchioles will expand, your heart rate will increase, you know, bang, 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 just have a list of a couple of them. And those always being the ones that you use in those types of questions but generally have an idea about the rest of them as well, because they may pop up in multiple choice. Um, the main thing to understand is that with this, the goal is always to energize the body. And this sort of goes, you know, with the stress response as well. The whole purpose of the sympathetic nervous system is to get the body going to, you know, yeah, to energize it. And so the idea is you always want to put your resources towards your muscles, but if, um, particularly like your skeletal, your peripheral muscles. So this idea of, you know, increased oxygen, um, being carried to the boards, your muscles, um, this idea of, you know, glucose as the source of energy, increased glucose mobilization, you know, increased energy to those muscles. Um, so that's why hopefully remembering that will help you remember, mem oh my gosh, remember these things. So thinking about, you know, you want more oxygen to those muscles. You're going to increase your breathing rate. Um, you know, you want again, more oxygen to your muscles. You're going to increase your heart rate, which is going to pump blood around carrying that oxygen to your muscles. Um, the other thing as well is this idea that your stomach and your other processes will shut down. So the idea with your um, stomach, you know, all the energy that requires, that is required for digestion. If I'm really stressed, you know, this idea of your, um, 
if you've got an immediate threat or something, if I'm being chased by a lion, whatever it is, I'm not really worried about digesting this morning's breakfast. Like you've got other priorities at this point and you want to use all your resources. You want all your resources to be, to be diverted to those muscles that need it, basically. So that's the idea why your digestion will be suppressed. It will slow down. Um, the other things as well, your adrenal glands. Adrenaline is a really important hormone that sort of activates this sort of thing, like adrenaline and noradrenaline. Um, and particularly, you know, it works to, again, increase that heart rate, increase that breathing rate, all those sorts of things. And then your parasympathetic nervous system. If you remember one of these columns, you'll remember the other because it's just the opposite. So parasympathetic, you just have to think about calming everything down. So your pupils contracting this idea that you don't really need to see as well as you need to see if you're running away from something. Um, again, your heart rate slowing down, everything coming back down to normal, you know, your gallbladder, your stomach, your intestines all working again in order to digest your stuff. Um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Okay. We'll move on now to a couple practice questions, particularly I'll say the stuff that we've gone over today quite often in multiple choice. Like things like the table we just looked at really popular in multiple choice, um, the role of the divisions, like the actual purpose, those sorts of things, particularly in multiple choice. Um, but often in short answer and particularly like early on in your short answer section, um, you might get, you know, three mark, four mark, even five mark questions describing sort of a response. So often like um, we won't talk about reflexes again today, but this idea of maybe describing the response of a reflex, you know, in terms of what goes on with your neurons, your nervous system. We'll have a look at a short answer practice question um, where it's the other common scenario of, you know, a conscious response. And you're asked to explain sort of the steps of, you know, the sensory aspect, then coordinating that response with the brain, then initiating that response as part of the motor, you know, the motor signals. Um, so really practice those as part of your short answer, because those four mark, five mark questions um, are really, really popular on this sort of topic of a response by the nervous system. All right. So which of the following divisions of the nervous system is responsible for the unconscious response to the pupil of the eye dilating or constricting in response to changing light lighting conditions? So as soon as you see unconscious response, um, and because it's this idea of the eye dilating or constricting, you know, you're thinking about initiating an actual response. Um, so you're sort of moving away from your central nervous system. So C or D, you're already cutting out. And then A or B, again, this word unconscious, that hints that it's more autonomic. Somatic would be the idea of, you know, a conscious, a voluntary response. But, you know, think about the table that we just looked at in terms of the people dilating and constricting. That's something you don't do voluntarily. Um, so that's controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Okay, next question. Claire grabs hold of a prickly weed whilst gardening and then consciously, again, like anything to do with unconscious, conscious or awareness, if you see that word as well, highlight it so you know where you should be going. Um, consciously lets go of it as she does not like the feel of the rough texture. Which division of the nervous system is responsible for the initial detection of the sensory stimuli in this case? So we're consciously detecting you know, the texture, we're thinking of like the sense of touch here. And then we're sending this information to the brain. The brain goes, ew, I don't really like that. I'm going to voluntarily let go of it. So you're thinking of the somatic nervous system. It would be autonomic if you're thinking about, um, again, more like with this stuff, if you're thinking about detection of sensory stimuli, that's not somatic. It's more the stuff to do with your, yeah, like your visceral, like your organs, your muscles, your glands, rather than things like touch and taste, which are more part of the somatic. Um, and then obviously we're not really thinking about the central nervous system here in terms of C and D because we're detecting sensory stimuli. Remember, that's part of the role of the peripheral nervous system. Um, this is a common question as well when they use things like prickly or particularly like warm um, because your discussion on the spinal reflex um, is sort of similar in terms of, you know, it'll be something that will initiate a reflex. So like something really like scaldingly hot um, or yeah, something like really sharp, you know, anything that will cause a reflex response. Um, but then they'll be really obvious in the question with that, because then it'll say like unconsciously or quickly without thinking lack of awareness. Um, and that's how you really differentiate between your conscious and your unconscious responses. So just be careful of tricks. Like obviously with this one, you can't fall in that trap because there's no option for the reflex. Um, but just be mindful of that. Okay, Arthur's performing art student who's undertaking his final dance exam in which he must perform a solo dance. Not long after beginning his performance, as he leaps across the floor, his heart's pounding rapidly, he's perspiring heavily, um, so sweating heavily. 
Which of the following subdivisions of Arthur's nervous system are responsible for Arthur's leaping, rapid heart rate, and increased perspiration? Um, so think of your leaping. So just look at your answer options, somatic or autonomic. Leaping, this is a voluntary skeletal muscle movement. Like involuntary le involuntarily leaping is a tricky thing to do. So we're thinking of somatic. Um, so already B and D are being topped out. Um, so if we've narrowed it down to A and C, you just have to look for something that differentiates it. So A is either saying that rapid heart rate and increased perspiration are from sympathetic or C is saying they're from parasympathetic. Remember, you're increasing your heart rate. You're increasing, you know, your sweat glands are increasing their activity. That's part of your sympathetic. So that's why A is correct. Remember, parasympathetic is thinking about being calm, thinking about being really zen. So you would have a decreased heart rate or a normal heart rate and you wouldn't be sweating or overly sweating. Okay, hopefully that's all clear. Those are super, super common sort of stock standard types of multiple choice questions. Um, looking at our short answer, so this is what I was talking about just before. Um, you get like, and often it's sort of early on in the exam as well, you get your little blurb that describes your response and you get like a billion lines. It's yeah, usually four or five marks um, and you just have to describe the response from start to finish basically. So Kerry had been walking for several minutes at Chadston due to the heat at the center. His feet became swollen and his shoes felt too tight. So he stopped for a moment to loosen his shoelaces. Again, thinking about this response. Again, the main thing that you think about is, am I thinking of a spinal reflex here? Or am I thinking about a conscious response? Nothing in here hints that, you know, this is an automatic movement. And again, think about the stimulus as well. Swollen feet, shoes feeling too tight. It's just this sort of discomfort. And that's what the brain, so the brain is sensing this discomfort um, or the brain is receiving information from, you know, Kerry's feet that we've got this unpleasant stimuli. So logically the brain goes, okay, how can I remove this unpleasant stimuli? I'm going to loosen my shoelaces. That's the coordinated response. So it's obviously what we've been discussing in this video. Um, that idea of your conscious response, you know, your afferent information, you're making this decision in the brain and then your efferent information and then you're acting, you know, your body is doing something in response to that stimulus. So um, even though we can sort of predict the question, you have to see exactly what they want you to talk about because you'll cater your answer based on obviously how many marks you've been given, but then the exact things I want from you. So in terms of the relevant components, such subdivisions of both the CNS and the PNS, Explain how Kerry's body was able to process and respond to the sensory information from the tension in his shoes. So really specifically, specifically here, they're mentioning like refer to your divisions of your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. So this means even when you talk about the somatic, um, you have to, you know, even when you talk about the brain, when you talk about the spinal cord, you should be referring to if it's part of the CNS or part of the PNS. So again, four marks, a very decent, hefty response. So the sensory receptors in Kerry's feet as well, always use the name. You need to apply it to the scenario. If you wrote everything correctly, got all of the marks right, but you didn't, um, you know, mention Kerry's name or you didn't make it specific to Kerry's feet or this scenario, you would lose a mark. So the sensory receptors in Kerry's feet detected tension from the shoes. So starting with your sensory information. So these are your sensory receptors. Then we need to get this information from your sensory receptors to your brain. So we send it via our sensory neurons, which are in the somatic nervous system. But remembering the prompt, we need to specify that we know that this is part of the peripheral nervous system. That then relays an afferent signal towards, you could say like sensory signal, I guess as well, but afferent signal towards the spinal cord. The spinal cord relayed the sensory signal to the brain for processing. Again, we're explicitly sta stating that we know what nervous system this is part of. So involving both divisions of the CNS, your spinal cord and your brain. The brain then initiated a voluntary response. This is vital for this question because this is a conscious response. So the brain is involved. The brain is the one telling your body what to do. And an efferent signal, again, sent via the spinal cord, the efferent signal was conveyed by motor neurons in order to initiate the necessary movement of the skeletal muscles, again, somatic nervous system, of Kerry's arm to loosen the shoelaces. So you can talk about Kerry's hands, you know, whatever, as long as you put that idea across. Um, so you can see, again, you base your answer around the specific instructions they give you. So the marks here are sort of separated into your, you know, your sensory information, then transmitting that sensory information, the role of the brain, and then the efferent information. 
really stock standard question. Get used to answering these types of questions. Just practice them as much as you can. Um, okay, identify and distinguish between the functions of the two divisions of the peripheral nervous system in responding to sensory stimuli. Um, so again, they're not explicitly stating it, so you need to be, like clearly name it here. Um, so you should hope that you know what divisions of the peripheral nervous system are. So we're talking about the somatic and the autonomic. Um, I guess like something that might trick students up if they don't know, you know, the diagram that we looked at at the start of this is they might, you know, they see two divisions and then they might go, oh, okay, you're sympathetic and you're parasympathetic. But you have to remember that that's part of your autonomic nervous system specifically. So somatic nervous system responsible for voluntary responses, detecting sensory stimuli from the environment, um, e.g. your tactile information, along with your activation of your skeletal muscles, which allows the individual to respond to sensory stimuli. Again, very specifically here, responding to sensory stimuli. Um, the autonomic nervous system is responsible for involuntary responses to sensory stimuli through changes to visceral muscles, which regulate activity of vital organs, such as the heart. So when it talks about visceral muscles, like the muscles around your organs, so like the muscles in your heart, for example, or like the muscles that contract, um, around your intestines, that sort of thing. For example, an increase in sweat gland activity in response to a warm environment. So hopefully that makes sense. So you need to identify, so you need to clearly state your somatic nervous system and your autonomic and then distinguish how they're different, even though they basically have the same, they basically have the same purpose of responding to your sensory stimuli. Um, but hopefully that is really clear. So it would be two marks for each division. All right. Hopefully that has been sort of a good quick run through and you've, you know, had a look at what the types of practice questions you might expect, um, you know, in your SACs or in your exams. So as a refresher, we had a look at your CNS and your PNS. And really importantly, remember that diagram. Remember that you've got your somatic and your autonomic from your peripheral and then your parasympathetic and your sympathetic from your autonomic. Um, we discussed that as well. And then um, remember when you, you know, go into your revision or your study on stress, that you also bring the information that we've discussed today in terms of that table. That information becomes really important as well. Um, and we had a look at multiple choice and the sort of typical extended short answer question. So both of those questions were four marks. Um, so you can see with this sort of thing, because they're quite complex, like processes or systems, um, you tend to have longer questions on them. But yeah, hopefully that made sense and has been sort of a good little refresher. Um, yeah, thanks so much for watching. Hopefully it was helpful.